with the retrospective here. Um, so yesterday, uh, we began our day on the retrospective, uh, working with a, a model that uh, we had previously built up, namely that associated with smoking and heart disease. And uh, this model uh, was extended in that first session to try to capture different alternative intervention scenarios. And it's very common, um, in fact, typical within the sort of modeling uh, that one uses a model with a set of different scenarios where often the um, the configuration for those different scenarios, the um, alternative assumptions uh, put in place by those different scenarios uh, are continue to be used as one involves the model uh, the model details. Um, although the scenarios may evolve along with that as the model becomes more uh, involved and sophisticated, uh, it, uh, the scenarios uh, may, may track that and may also incorporate additional assumptions, et cetera. But within this context, uh, there's normally a baseline scenario. And, and that scenario um, sometimes reflects a kind of business as usual or um, default set of assumptions, uh, perhaps representative of uh, the current, uh, what's believed to be a representation of the current situation. Perhaps instead it, it just represents a particularly simple um, set of assumptions about, uh, about the, the system. But regardless of its exact definition, what unites it, what, what defines it as a baseline, really is that it serves as a reference point. Um, a reference point against which to compare the results of other scenarios. With the realization being that uh, it's, it's easier to make sense of how a a given scenario, say an intervention scenario, has altered things if you could compare it against the comparable context without the intervention. So you compare the situation with the intervention with one without and draw conclusions about the effects of that intervention. Not all scenarios, though, represent, in alternative scenarios represent intervention scenarios. Um, some may be what if scenarios involving different exogenous assumptions. Maybe it's assumptions about um, initiation rate in youth um, as dictated by changes in the availability of e-cigarettes. Um, or maybe it's something about the, in another what if scenario might might involve alternative assumptions about the the economic climate or what have you, the availability of of uh, of healthcare, and um, these are not necessarily factors under your control, but they're factors um, that your your interest in understanding how the model results differ when you make those alternative assumptions, alternatives from the baseline. Now, when it comes to the, um, the, the robustness of a model, it, the amount of confidence it do in certain types of results, this phenomenon of comparing some baseline scenario with some alternative scenario bears some bear some thought. So so perhaps we have a baseline scenario here and we have some alternative scenario here. 
that lowers some measure of health burden, right? This this might be some some sort of abstract depiction of of health burden here. coming out of the model. I'm I'm glossing over what particular condition we're looking at and so on, but we have baseline. And we all have alternatives. So this is baseline, and we have some alternate, which might re reflect an intervention or or some one if scenario. And you know, when it comes to models, um, I've invaded against, I've exhorted against, uh, against the the view of them simply as crystal balls um, uh, and and urged, you know, thinking about a focus on the modeling process, not the model by itself, but models as learning tools, models as tools that allow us to fail early, fail often in terms of our realization of, of our hypotheses and learn and advance our understanding where they more quickly identify where our understanding is off base than if we had no model. It's through a model, we can test our understanding and see if it's consistent with the evidence. See if, it, if we put our understanding, our best understanding of the situation uh, and encode it in a model in, in a precise enough way, we can evaluate where is it on, on, uh, on par, where is it uh, off base? Where does it fall short of explaining what we see empirically? So I, I've, I've urged not viewing, you know, models as, as crystal balls, so as learning tools. But, you know, a recurrent issue that comes in, particularly for some uses of models, if you want to try to explain trends, if you want to try to anticipate what might be, you know, coming for the next bunch of years, if, you, um, if you're seeking to understand at a quantitative level the trade-offs between a set of interventions, there's natural questions and uh legitimate questions that come up about the, the accuracy of the model. And I'd like to make one point here, which is a subtle one, and it's one that's oft missed by modelers. And it's one that I wish more of my students were here to, were here to hear, um, uh, because I, I think it really informs a better understanding of models. Someone could be, um, all models are simplificated. All models are approximate. All models have inevitable omissions, misestimates, um, uh, you know, overly limited or, or scope that's very limited compared to the phenomena in the world more generally. And it can be argued very legitimately that sometimes your model omits factors that would affect the outcome. And someone could bring to the table a critique. Well, okay, this is what the baseline scenario results in the model. But if you included these other factors, maybe you would instead get, I'm gonna draw it the same color, but a dotted line. Maybe you would instead get, you know, something of this sort. Um, it would be off by a certain amount. Someone could could legitimately raise concerns about that thing. That it omits this, it omits that, it, it, it doesn't take into account this factor. But the interesting thing is that many of those factors might affect other scenarios as well in kind of similar ways. So yes, indeed, maybe the baseline scenario is significantly off from what we would see if we incorporated five additional factors known to, to govern the situation. But if we incorporated those five factors into the base, into the alternative scenario, we might see something like this. And when we compare, so, so you could say, look, the baseline is off compared to what we would get if we incorporated those five factor factors. And that's true. And we could say that the that the intervention scenario is off compared to what we would get if 
we examine those 500 factors. And that might be true. But the difference between the baseline and intervention, the difference between those at any one point in time might, not, might be a lot less different then it, the difference between those might be fairly well conserved between you know, what our model does now versus our model if we included those five factors. That difference between them, between the two scenarios, the baseline and alternative now, or the baseline alternative if we spent the extra time to incorporate these five extra factors, those might be a lot closer to each other in those differences than the baseline would be to what would be produced by if we incorporated those factors or the alternative compared to what it would be if we incorporated those five factors. So sometimes what you get in terms of critique of model structure that you've left out X, Y, Z, A, B, C, bites less you know, tightly, that's keen, uh, less keenly, um, if you are considering differences between two scenarios, between baseline and alternative, for example, that difference might cancel out a lot of the effects of these factors you've left out to the model. Now, it doesn't always, but it is worth thinking about that, you know, um, well, it is true that the exact trajectory coming out of your model might be different if you incorporated factors X, Y, Z, A, B, C. The difference between the baseline and the intervention might be pretty similar with those extra factors. It isn't always, but, but um, in many cases, it can be um, much better conserved in that sense. So I'll, I'll just note that the baseline and counterfactual scenarios uh, when compared with one another, with one another, um, uh, have uh, a uh, a matter of, of of comparison there that uh, may be less fraught um, uh, compared to uh, in in terms of inaccuracies compared to model scope than you might think naively. So. Um, I have a set of uh, slides that I'm not going to be able to give um, by default. Um, I would give them if, if there's a uh, desire to do so tomorrow, but um, I'm going to be posting them. These are on kind of scenarios and baseline versus alternative scenarios and factors involved in uh, formulating them, et cetera. Uh, so uh, some folks here might find these uh, these extra slides uh, worth uh, worth looking at. Um, and I'm just going to post them to that folder on the, the slides. Okay. Um, so that was one thing we saw yesterday. But the other thing we saw yesterday, the, actually the, the bigger part of yesterday, when spent on introducing really um, nonlinearity, a situation where we had interactions between individuals. I argued the morning, the, the, the model we had worked to um, till then, well, at some level, a model of a complex system, while well, it exhibited emergent behavior, um, it uh, it didn't exhibit um, hallmarks of serious nonlinearity. The one in the afternoon did. And I, I argued that one way to sort of consider that is um, that model in, that we were working with before, with the heart disease and smoking, if we were to um, examine the results for two subsets of the population, two as we say, disjoint, separate subsets of population. Population members A and population members B. Let's say each is 100 people. And we were to consider the, the results of simulated for A, and we get some 
number of heart disease deaths. We got some number of cumulative number of people who've uh, died from died, died from heart disease, but also um, the number that developed heart disease and and the the prevalence of smoking over time. And we considered, uh, excuse me, the count of people who smoke over time. And we considered separately um, for the second subset of people, 100 people. And we considered that. If we were then combined with a total population, a combined population of both A and B, both populations, we would get out results that would be the sum of the two in terms of the count of smokers or the count of people who have died from heart disease or the count of people that have developed heart disease, et cetera. It, it simply adds. By contrast with the infectious disease model, that's not, not the case, right? Um, it's not the case because we, amongst other things, if we simulated, you know, a set of initially infected people, purely initially infected, that's our group A, and we simulated the results there, they all start infected. And then we have another group that all starts susceptible. And we are to get the results out of both in terms of the count of people you know, the kind of people recovering over time or losing immunity over time or what have you, that that total for each in isolation, if you were to sum it up, it would be very different from the total for the combined population with susceptible and infective in the same population. It goes without saying, you need two to tango and the two are intertwined there. People are intertwined. We could have introduced that to the morning model with peer pressure on smoking, and we could always do that if there were uh, interest in doing so. It would illustrate other ways of people interacting besides what we explored in the afternoon. But in the afternoon, we explored the use of messages, people sending messages to one another um, to interact via the network. And we saw that it induced nonlinear patterns, patterns that were nonlinear in terms of the relationship between income on the one hand and a uh, cumulative number of times infected on the other. So those were, those were the models that uh, we examined yesterday, they're posted, and uh, we followed best practice by going through successive versions of them. Um, one would normally accompany that by notes on what each version represented and keep a track of the relationship between those versions, the parameter assumptions for scenarios and the results output by those parameter assumptions. Okay, so that was um, uh, yesterday in a nutshell, the effects of nonlinearity, speaking about um, uh, scenarios and comparing scenarios, capturing in this case interventions through parameters, but with uh, a note that in quite a few models, we actually will simulate the mechanics of the intervention more closely. Rather than just tweaking a parameter, we'll actually simulate the processes, whether it's training, peer educators will then go out and and influence um, their fellow students, or whether it's delivering interventions, uh, the once prevalence of infection, of reported infections reaches a certain level and that kicks in, um, or, or simulating um, the mechanisms associated with clinics. Uh, sometimes we represent interventions in a more active fashion. Okay. Um, so uh, that was yesterday in a nutshell. Any any matters on which you'd like to dialogue or about which you'd like to ask? Any things that are kind of on your mind or any requests that you'd like to bring to the fore before we start on today? Once again, last night I posted a an updated schedule. Um, uh, as as planned, but uh, as I've long emphasized, it is subject to requests. So are there any things you'd like to ask about, about what you'd like to ask?
participants, TAs. Thank you, Nona. That's awesome. Questions? Online? Okay. I think uh, absent that, we will...